Amen. Well, we have, we have truly been led to the Lord in worship this morning. I am thankful for that, and I'm glad you're here today. I pray your heart's been stirred and you have uh, been moved as well. God has been more than gracious to us, and uh, we are excited to get to worship Him. And we're excited about that service on uh, the 20th, that Sunday evening. Uh, please go ahead and make preparations for that. Plan on being here. It's going to be a wonderful time together. Candlelight service, uh, I don't know, you got a skit, a drama, no skit or drama this year, but uh, it is going to be a wonderful time uh, together, and uh, we, uh, it's always a special time uh, on those evenings or uh, those uh, Sunday nights just before Christmas. Uh, this is one of our favorite times of year. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2. Our thoughts have been on Christmas. We would really like to have uh, maybe started at a different place as we think about the Christmas story. But this is, uh, this is the way the Lord has, has led us today. I want to encourage you to come out on Wednesday nights. On Wednesday nights we're going through the book of John, the Gospel of John. It's a very exciting uh, book. Uh, it's a book about belief and it's a book about faith. Uh, so we are very excited to be able to, to go through this book. And on these Wednesday nights, the Lord has been blessing greatly. And we want to ask you to, to come and be a part of that. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we need those midweek services. They are an encouragement, the worship, and then uh, again, the Word. Uh, so uh, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, if you're able, I know you just sat down, but uh, you just eat for Thanksgiving. You're about to eat for Christmas. You need a little workout today. Uh, so stand up, take a deep breath, uh, get some uh, oxygen to, uh, in your uh, blood and to your muscles, uh, and that way you'll be wide awake to hear what the Lord has to say today. Uh, and so uh, our thought today, uh, as we thought about these wise men, uh, is on the gifts of Christmas or the gifts of the wise men. Uh, they brought gifts, uh, but as I thought and I prayed and I, I, I studied about them and thought about them and just put myself in their shoes uh, we're, you're going to see, I think, today that, that really they were given the gift. Uh, and I know we've been given the greatest gift of all. They've sung about it today. We've been given the gift of Jesus and uh, the redemption he brought you and I. That he died, he shed his blood while we were yet sinners. He knew who we were. Better than that, he knows who we are. Uh, yet he still died for us. Uh, what, a, what about that? I mean, just a love so great we cannot comprehend. So that is the greatest gift of all, that he would save us, make us his, and give us a home in heaven and give us abundant life in this life. But the wise men, they brought these gifts. And as we look at their journey, I think you're going to see that maybe they were given one of the greatest gifts. And so look with me in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now the Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Verse um, 5. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, and sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not uh, return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. May God add the blessings to the reading of his word. You may be seated as we start thinking about these gifts of the wise men. Um, so let me say a few things about the wise men quickly, just so you really have caught all that's in this text. 
um, and, and maybe dispel a couple of myths. Just some information for you so you will be Bible students and Bible scholars. We've always assumed and in our Christmas plays there's three wise men because there's three gifts that are mentioned uh, but more than likely, there were a dozen or so wise men, or maybe even 50 of these wise men. And who are the wise men? What did they do? Uh, these were men who, who uh, were very intellectual. Uh, they could discuss philosophy. They were trained in many sciences, and one of those was astrology. They were readers of the stars. And so Herod surrounded himself with these men, and they were considered royalty. Uh, because he wanted advice, and he wanted information, and he needed intellectuals around him. He needed people to interpret the dreams, and he needed people to read uh, the stars for him, because they believed uh, the answers to life was found in, in the stars. And so that's who they were. And so there were many of these wise men. And when Jesus was born, the star appeared, and that, that, that brought in their mind a reminder from the Old Testament scriptures about where Jesus would be born. They began this search, and this search was a two-year search. It wasn't the same night that the shepherds received the message as Jesus was born and worshipped him, but for two years, these wise men, however many in number, began this journey on their way to find Jesus. And when they found Jesus, he was no longer baby Jesus in a manger. I'm not throwing kinks in things, and I'm not legalistic, and if I see a manger scene where there's wise men standing there with the donkeys and the sheep and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, all, and baby Jesus laying in the manger, I'm not going to jump out of my truck and run over and throw the wise men out of the picture. Uh, but the reality is, is that when, he had, when the wise men had made it to Jesus, the text we just read says that he was a young child by that time, a toddler, if you will, and they were no longer in a manger, but they were in a house somewhere. Uh, and so the star guided them and led them. So that's all in your text. And I want you to understand, let's put ourselves in this text because this is what we really need to know today. And so oftentimes our uh, Christmas season, uh, it is uh, filled with all warm things and all good things and it is filled with blessings, uh, and it is filled with happiness, and it is filled with joy, and rightfully so. I love Christmas. It's my favorite holiday. I'm, I'm, a, I'm of that sort that believes you ought to put up all your Christmas stuff the day after Thanksgiving, uh, and you ought to leave it up until at least New Year's Day, and shame on you if you take it down any sooner. That's just my opinion. I love everything about Christmas. I, I love just the season. I love the festiv festivities. I love the activities. I love Christmas lights. I was driving somewhere the other evening and I went by a place, a house, I, I believe it was, that, uh, that it had the most, uh, the most uh, let me think how to be nice about this, uh, it had the most ridiculous looking lights hung all around this house. A very, very poor uh, job of hanging, I mean it, it just was a, it was a sham. Uh, and, uh, and I looked at that and that was my thought to begin with, but then because I love Christmas so much I was like, even those ugly lights, and that ugly decoration, the ug ugly hanging of those lights, it's still beautiful to me. Just because I love, I love all about Christmas. I've come over here, I love the fact that uh, these ladies have all these lights in this church on timers, and, and so uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, I'll stroll through here during the week, and the whole church, the lights are out in the church, but all these lights are on these trees and, and these wreaths and things like that, and it just warms my heart, I love it. Uh, I love the giving of gifts. I love that part of Christmas. Uh, I love the eating. I love the, the fact that you see people maybe you usually don't get to see and, and you get to spend a little bit time with them for this one time of year. And for many people we know this one time of year in a few minutes is enough, amen? You got any family like that? They say the same thing about me and you too, so that's okay. We can say it about them because they've already said it. And so Christmas is just wonderful. I can't speak of that enough. I, I, I just love it. It's my grandpa's favorite holiday because he spent so many uh, Christmases in the South Pacific and, and there uh, on, on uh, formerly Japanese-held islands. And, and so he always loved being home uh, for Christmas. Well, I love it too. But I want to break our, I want to break a myth, if you will, and I want to kind of shatter in a very nice and pleasant way our thoughts that we have of that first Christmas. And I've got a message I preach on Mary and I don't know if I get to preach it this year, but it's been, uh, it's, I've, I've promised the Lord when, I, when He gave it to me the first time that I'd preach it every year. 
uh, because it's so moving and it's a, it's a slice of reality for us. But that first Christmas was not filled with all of this warmth and, and all of these, these smiles and, and, and lights and decorations and blessings and excitement. The first Christmas was nothing like that. So let's talk about these wise men and what it was like for them. So as Jesus was born, they saw the star in the sky. They got a glimpse of that, that star in the night sky. And it moved them, and not only did it move them, uh, but it called them, if you will, uh, and it began to lead them. They saw that star and they knew that they had a purpose. Uh, a purpose greater than what uh, Herod used them for. I mean, they were considered royalty. They, they were surrounded uh, by royalty every day, and, and they were in the king's presence. And when the king needed advice, he come to them. And, and so they were in an elevated position. And so greater than what they were doing at the time, they had this calling. They had this star that was leading them. Deep inside of them, they had been moved and there was now suddenly this purpose on their life. Let me stop right there and say, just say this before we go any further because you're going to need to hear this before I, before I break out the really bad from this text. You, you need to know that God has a purpose for your life. He's got a calling uh, on your life. And, and young people, let me encourage you. And I say young people, and I mean this for, uh, from uh, birth to, to age uh, 100. I don't think anybody here is that old right now. But, uh, so if, if you're anywhere in that age range, God's got a call and a purpose on your life. You, you need to know that. Uh, but, uh, uh, but particularly young people, because at my age, I'm 49 and holding for a long, long time, is that... Uh, we kind of have our mind made up and our path set and the direction our course is made. We're not going to change it. But for young people, you're, you're uh, malleable, you're shapeable, you're moldable. And God can still touch your life and, and guide you and you'll listen. I hope you'll listen. So young people, listen to me. Greater than you trying to figure out how you're going to go to college, what you're going to go to college for, where you're going to go to college, who you're going to date, who you're going to marry, you need to know this. And you need to ask this, is that God's got a purpose for you. I'm going through puberty, my voice is squeaking, so you hang on. It's part of my Christmas joy, folks. God's got a purpose for you. He's got a call upon your life. If you'll get still and if you'll listen and if you'll ask Him, what is your call on my life? What is your purpose for me? What do you want me to do with my life, Lord? Because my life's not my life, it's your life. And so one of the things that needs to be done here in, this, in an invitation in a little while, and I won't come back to this because I won't remember it, but one of the things you need to do is, is you need to come to this altar and you need to say, Lord, here's my life. I take my hands off of it. I relinquish any rights that I have to my life. Lord, you know my dreams. You know what I want so bad. You know what my ambitions are. You know what I desire. You know what I like. You know who I like. And you know where I like, but Lord, here today, I take my hands off all of my life and I give you full rights to my life, so lead me in your purpose. Reveal your purpose to me. Show me your calling on me. And Lord, may you get the glory for all that I am and who I am. And so that's what you need to do today. And so these, these wise men, they had this star that was guiding them. And it was leading them. And it was moving them. And many adults here today, they will testify to you that, that through life that, that there's been this leading in their life. And I believe the Lord can so lead you. I believe sometimes He'll lead you places you didn't want to go, to do things you didn't want to do, to be maybe what you didn't want to be. But the Lord's leading you all along life's way. And so now watch this just for a minute. I want you to see this. So this star led these men. And being from northern Arabia, much of their travel was at night time. The daytime was too hot. Uh, and, and so even today, those desert travelers over there and those, those native people, they, uh, during the daytime, they stay in shade, they rest, they stay out of the sun, and in the evening hours and nighttime, they get up and they begin to move. 
And so these wise men moved at night and they were led by that star as the, as the scripture tells us. Uh, and, uh, and it was, let me say this, and so they were led by this star. You gotta know that for a star to shine at night time, there has to be darkness. I understand that's not rocket science. I get that, so don't look at me like I'm stupid. But when we, when we think about this star leading these wise men, you do know that there had a prerequisite to being led by this star was that there had to be darkness over the land. And so through this dark journey, being led only by a star, they encountered many dangers and many snares. At night time, you have to face all of the criminals that are in the desert. Robbers, if you will, who will come in and rob you, take everything you have, and leave you there just uh, deserted and alone. Uh, you've got all of the wild animals at night time that you face. And I want you to understand this, that, that as you're in the night time, as stars fill the sky and you are led only by starlight. You don't see the details of what's ahead. I spent a lot of time outside in just various activities of my lifetime at night. A lot of time at night time in the outdoors. And I think about times that I've been outdoors and and ha at night time only led by the light of the moon and the stars and how that I could look ahead and I could see big features way down the road. They were pretty obvious, maybe like a little ridge line or, or whatever the case may be. But I couldn't see all the details in between. I, I couldn't see all the little steps. Now had the sun been out, I would be able to see everything in between. And there's that time of morning when you're sitting in a tree stand when everything's just kind of gray. Uh, and you, you can't really make out this and that and, and so forth. That's, that's that time of day when you're sitting there looking at just the gray darkness down through the woods and in the next blink you see a, there's actually a deer standing there. You start making it out as it gets more and more light. Uh, but everything's gray in the dark and then uh, as daylight begins to break, the sun comes out, it illuminates all the little details. You see maybe that it really wasn't a deer standing there, that it's maybe just a stunt with the snag hanging off of it or whatever the case may be. Uh, but so it's not full daylight. Listen, just hang on. It's not fully. It's not daylight, but it's only the star that's guiding them. And, and so they're going into the unknown. They're going into the uncertain. They're going through all these dangers, these valleys, these um, these uh, uh, these obstacles, these trials, if you will. But all the while, the Lord is there and He's leading them, and He's guiding them. And think about the trip, think about the time. Two years. Two years they follow this star at night time. Two years they stick with it. Two years they endure. Two years they press forward. Man, they had resolve because they knew they were being led. So you see, you see the picture. I mean, do we need to rewind the tape and start over? We good? All right, nod your head. All right. So what's that mean to me and you? What's that mean to us? Here's what that means to us. You've got to know that there's a big purpose that God has placed upon you and in you. This high calling that God has put in your life. That He not only is so interested in you that He loved you and sent His Son Jesus to die for you and to save your soul, but He loves you so much that He wants to use you. That He's got a purpose for you. He has this calling for you. He's got this place that He wants you to arrive at one day somewhere in life. God's got this marvelous plan and it's bigger than the plan you ever decided for yourself and it's bigger than the plan that you ever made for yourself. That God's got good things in store for you, His child. That God's got blessings in store for you. And what, listen, what God wants is He's not, listen, He's got you where you're at today, not so you can stumble around in the dark and question Him and why God am I here? Why am I there? Why is this happening? Why is this taking place? But He's got you where you're at so that you could look to Him and feel that leading and feel that drawing and, and feel Him guiding your life even where you're at right now. God's doing the work. Why? Because he's got this plan for you. This wonderful plan. 
So just remember this. When you're sitting on the sidelines of life, when you've been sitting down on the bench of life, listen to me. You must understand that He's leading you. That He's there guiding you. When you're, if you're watching on Liberty Live or, or you're here and, and you've woke up and your spouse has left or, or the marriage has failed, listen to me, you've got to know that He's there guiding you and He's, He's leading you. See, it's in the dark of night. It's in the toughest of times. It's when darkness fills the sky around you. You must understand and you must know that He is ever there leading you. Why? Because He's got this place. He's got a plan and He's got a purpose for your life. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you're watching right now or you're here and maybe you've just lost your job Then you've got to know that He's beside you and He's still guiding you and He's still leading you. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe a friend has walked away from you or turned away from you and left you. Then you've, you've got to understand that He's there guiding you. Maybe you've loved somebody you shouldn't have loved, but He's there guiding you. Maybe somebody, uh, maybe, uh, maybe that it's your career choice or your finances or maybe the doctor has given you a bad report this week. You must know that He's guiding you. He's drawing you. He's leading you. See, all along life's way, oftentimes when the valleys come, when the darkness come, when the trials come, when the struggles come, we say, woe is me, and we look at the struggle, and we look at the trial, and we look at the burden. And unfortunately, this is so, so true that even the most spiritual of us, that it's years down the road before we look back and we can see those trials as a place where God led us and He was guiding us through them. And he was walking with us to bring us to where He wants us to be. And so see, some of you right now, you're, you're in that place. You're in a place where there's so many uncertainties and there's so many unknowns and you're in a place where you have heartache and you're in a place where, you're, where your heart breaks and you're in a place where your mind doesn't quit working because life's thrown you a curveball. You're not where you thought you'd be and you're in an unexpected place. But you now have to see from these wise men that He's leading you all along the way, even in those places. In fact, listen, if you feel abandoned by God, I assure you, if you feel like you can't find God or feel God or you don't know he, where He's leading or what He's doing in your life, if you feel like God has withdrew Himself or hid Himself, I assure you that it is in these times indeed that He's still very present, but He's leading you and guiding you because He's got this plan this place where you're, you're going to be one day. Now think about God operating like this. See, you and I, we only want good stuff for our children, of, of what we perceive as good stuff. We never want them to suffer. We never want them to hurt. We never want them to ache. We never want them to have troubles. We never want them to have skint knees or, or bumped heads. We, 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 don't want all, we don't want any of that. Any of that. Now, I've seen so many accidents and stuff like that and, and been an accident so many times in my life. And when Liz was, Elizabeth was born, I, all I could think about was every accident or sorrow or tragedy I've ever seen a child go through. And so I didn't want her to, uh, I didn't want her to experience any of that. So I tried to protect her from everything. I was like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Made her scared to death, poor little thing. I could tell her stand on one spot and she'd stand there for three days at three years old because she's afraid something bad's going to happen to her because I had her so scared. We can't protect our children from all those things. In fact, it takes some skint and knees so a kid can learn how to ride a bike. It takes a bumped head so he can learn how to move on a pair of roller skates. It takes some tripping while running through the house, smashing their face against something to... Uh, to, to realize and to learn along life's way. And so see, the Lord withholds nothing from us. He could just shower us with blessing and hold back all the bad, what we perceive as bad, all the valleys, all the darkness. But the Lord knows we need to experience it and we need to live it and, and, and we need to be there at times. And what we've got to know is this, He's leading you even in those times. He is present with you even in those times. He's near you even during those times. Don't you think in two years' time, two years' time searching for the promise, two years searching for a promise, 
And by the way, that was a word for them. That was a promise to them. And they were going to find the Christ child. The scripture had spoke to their heart. Two years waiting on a promise. And you know what? We get tired of waiting for one week or one month or eight months or nine months. But I want you to know something. When God's made you a promise, it doesn't matter if it's one week, one month, or ten years. He'll bring that promise to pass. How do you know that? Because I know God's not a liar. That's another promise from the Word. He cannot lie, the Bible says. And so you need heat for two years. They stuck with it. For two years they endured. For two years they pressed on. For two years they kept going. For two years they kept traveling. Even when they didn't understand it. Even when apparent bad had been done to them or they were suffering through bad things. They kept going and they kept going and they kept going. And they kept trusting that, that when it was all said and done, they were being led by the hand that made them. And you've got to know that. I don't care if everybody has forsaken you. He's still with you. I don't care if life turned out the way you thought it would or life is as you would hope it to be. He's still guiding you and He's still leading you. What to? To something better. He's always got something better for His children. You need to write that down and remember that. Now the journey there may be a whole other story. It may be a desert journey at night time. But God's always got something better for those that belong to Him. Job said it best. He said, He knows the way that I take. Do you get that? What's happened to you has not surprised God. But preacher, you don't know I didn't deserve. It doesn't matter it didn't surprise God. But you don't know I worked really hard. It doesn't matter it didn't surprise God. But you don't know what they've said about me. It doesn't matter because it didn't surprise God. But you don't know what they've done to me. It doesn't matter because He's there guiding you. Because He's got something better for you. Boy, some of you ought to say hallelujah right there. Because you've been through the long dark night. Because you've been through desert journeys. And it ought to help. And maybe that's you today, and you need to know that there's a hand that is unseen that is guiding you. And I pray today that you will see that. I pray you'll see that hand today, that you don't have to wait 10 years down the road, look back on your life, and say, Boy, during some of the most deepest struggles of my life, I see the hand of God and how it worked. That you'll see it now, today. Girls, you come, at least put that verse up for me, if you don't mind. So two years they endured this. Two years. They traveled. They kept their faith. They held the course. Why? Because they, were knew, they knew they were being guided. Listen up. Here's the thing about the church today. I want you to listen. Listen, most of us are living life with no purpose at all. No purpose at all. We're just running around, right in on the rat race. We usually don't stop but just a few minutes on maybe Sunday mornings to drop in and do a favor for God. It was what we think is doing a favor for God. We're going to go to church on Sunday. Well, that's doing God no favor. And then we're done until next Sunday. We're wandering around without purpose in our life. But listen... If you're a child of God, God's got a purpose for you. God's purpose for Moses wasn't even revealed until he was 80 years old. My grandpa quit pastoring somewhere in his mid-80s, or early 80s probably, and he said, uh, he told me, he said, there's, there's a time when a man needs to quit pastoring and he needs to pass the torch. Uh, and uh, he said, that's my time now. And he said, so I've passed the torch. Uh, and uh, I don't know where, somewhere around 90, we moved him into a nursing home uh, retirement facility him and my grandmother, and they had a local church coming in reading the Sunday school lesson on Sunday morning right out of the quarterly, word for word, and that just upset him terribly. Uh, he said, I can read it word for word. I don't need somebody coming in here reading it to me straight out of the book saying we're having church and then leaving. He said, I can do that. And in that same retirement home, there was a little lady about 90 who was a former piano player in a Baptist church, played for some 40 or 50 years. And so he said, hey, we got a piano in there in the cafeteria. He said, how about on Sunday mornings you play that thing and we'll sing and we'll spread word around this nursing home and I'll preach. And so just like that, in just a short time, he had, his, he had another church in his 90s and he was pastor of. 
He gathered all them people up and get them in that little cafeteria or that little dining room eating area and she would play whatever she would play out of the, the old red book and all those nursing home uh, people, those retirement home people, they would worship and praise the Lord and then with his cane, he'd prop himself back against that piano just long enough to preach a little word to them. He got a new call in his 90s. How old are you today? What are you doing with your life? Why are you letting this curveball be a hiccup in your journey? Why are you letting the darkness stop you? Why are you letting the valley move you? Why are you letting the dangers and the toils and the snares get you all out of sort? Yeah, I'm not saying you should be fearful. I'm not saying I'm not saying you shouldn't be fearful. I'm not saying you shouldn't question. That's all human. It's all natural. I'm just saying that you need to recognize that you're being guided and that he's there leading you. If I could let you stand up and give testimony right now, especially our older people, there'd be some of them stand up and they would tell you about tragedies unspeakable. They'd tell you about valleys that have no bottom that they've walked through. And then they'd also tell you how that when they look back, they see the hand that guided them, the hand that brought them to where they are today. So watch what happens. I, I think about this verse from, from an old, old song. It says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. But t'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, many it's a long, dark journey for the believer filled with dangers and toils and snares. I promise you that. But grace, couldn't buy it, couldn't beg for it. He just gives it freely. It's safely leading me and it will lead me home. Okay, now watch this. Hang on, because, you, because God's doing something in your heart right now. Listen, watch this. Maybe next Sunday I'll get to preach on the actual gifts. That's where we were going today. It didn't make it that far. Watch this. So at the end of that journey, Herod's won't know where the wise or where the baby Jesus is or where, where they find the Messiah, the Savior. He says, Come back and tell me so I can worship him, but worship's not on his heart. He wants to kill Jesus. So he lied. He wants to kill Jesus. But notice what these wise men did at the end of this journey. Watch. <laughs> I mean, after two years of darkness, journeying in lands unknown, I'm just going to confess, I'd have been frustrated. After two years of night struggles, desert struggles, facing bandits and robbers and wild animals, I'm going to confess, after two years, I've got a list of complaints. I'm just telling you me. And, my, and they show up there at, the, at, 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 at the, the small child Jesus. And uh, what is it the text says? Uh, that then they laid all of their complaints before him. Lord, it's been a long, dark journey. I'm hurting, I'm suffering, I need you. And so what does the text say? The text says uh, that, that they begin to complain. You, you called us and put a purpose on us, but you let all this happen. Why'd you do that? No, no, that's not what I said. What does the text say? The text said, does the text say they, they fell at his feet and said, I don't understand why I've been through what I've been through. I don't understand why life sidelined me. I don't understand why friends walked away from me. I don't understand why that it turned out this way. I had a plan. I had it set out. I had it laid out, and I just don't understand why I've come to this today. No, no, they didn't say that. But see, what they did, the Bible says, is that when they found where he was at, that number one, they began to rejoice with great joy. But number two, they worshiped him. I think there are, I think there's a message in the gifts they brought. I've got it in my heart. But I think the most important thing to see is this, is that at the end of this two-year struggle, they were resilient, they purposed, they knew they were being led, they were being guided, 
at the end of all of that, they still were able to fall at his feet and bring these gifts. And by bringing these gifts, here's what they said. It's all about you. It's all about you, Lord. It's not about us. It's not about how discouraged I got along the way. It's not about how somebody was unfair to me. It's not about how somebody treated me wrong. It's not about how deep and dark of places I've walked in in my lifetime. But Lord, you have guided me and led me and it's all about you. It's all about you, Lord. And I want you to get this and check this out. And I want you to experience this. Some of you, you're bound in bondage right now because you're still holding on to what was done to you and where life has led you and the darkness you've walked through and the obstacles you face and the toils and the snares along life's way. You're chained by that and bound by that because that's you can't quit thinking about it and get over and get past it. But I'm going to tell you how to break those chains today and I'm going to tell you how they'll fall off immediately. It's when you just make it all about Him. When you say, Lord, it's still all about you. Life's not been easy. Life's not been fair. Decisions have been made about me. I've been pushed. I've been walked away from. I've been shoved in a corner. But Lord, despite all of that, it's not about me. It's still all about you, Lord. It's all about you. So young people, if I was you today, because even at a young age, life's not fair. Some of you are 16 years old. 15 years old and you've already found out that life is not perfect and life is not fair. But what I do right now is is I would just come and I would take my hands off my life and say, Lord, here's my life. I see now that friends that are walking away at this time in my life, I see now that dreams have not come true like I thought it would. I see now that the struggles I faced, the, the things that have been said against me or spoke against me, the things that the enemy intended for bad, God, I see that you're doing it, for, you're allowing it for good. And so, Lord, my hand's off of me and I'm making it all about you. All about you, Lord. I, I just want to say that, yes, Jesus is the greatest gift of all. The salvation he's provided, the greatest gift of all. But if there was a next best gift, I would say that it's Him leading us. Even in the valleys, even in the storms, even in the struggles, even when we don't understand, even when life's unfair. Knowing and having confidence in a promise God has spoke to us that He's leading us. He's got a purpose for us. He's doing something in your life. You gotta hang on, man. You gotta hang on. God's doing something. God's taking you somewhere, and what He's taking you to is better, is better than something you've ever known. It's, it's bigger than anything you've ever known. You've got to believe, and you've got to know that He's guiding you. And I think now would be a good time just to say, Lord, I wouldn't have chosen this way or this path. You chose it. I trust you, and I'm going to believe that you're leading me, even when I don't understand. I want you to stand. Lord's already spoke to you. You need to be moving. Push somebody out of your way. Come down the side aisle. Come down the middle aisle. Come from the back of the church, the front of the church. Maybe this is your first time here. You still need to come. I want you to come quickly.